I'm, and I'm just sat at the front anyway. In case. <laughs> okay, thanks, Rob. <coughs> Does it do the same thing? It does the same thing. But this one's on now. Yeah, I believe. And I don't need that because I can see the box. Are you 
you ready to go as well? I'm ready to go, yeah. What made you feel comfortable? I do, yes, I just need to switch on my back, my left back. <laughs> it is here. Right. I hope it's still connected. The rubble, rubble that's kind of made for <laughs> yeah. you. People come at five past five. <laughs> well, that's a lot of people already. Might have been said. I'm ready to go, yeah. Just rub children, have a second, I think. Okay, everyone.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, I'm just adjusting to the sound quality. My voice tends to fade as it goes on, so please, at the back there, um, wave if you can't hear what I'm saying uh, when we get over halfway or even before then. Um, now, let me see if I can work this, oh sorry, I'm from, there we go, and just see, yeah please, C, control F, was that right? There we go. So, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the illustrious Slade. Um, I'm just going to leave this uh, image running for a while while I make a longer introduction. Um, it should start again in a second. It's a film of Richard Wilson's uh, Turning the Place Over, which was a, um, an artwork uh, in Liverpool, which started in 2007 and is still there, but unfortunately it's not still turning. Um, and it was uh, commissioned in the context of the regeneration of that particular area. Um, and turning the place over in English means, has two kind of meanings. Its, its main meaning is that you just, it's about change. Things are changing. Uh, but the subliminal meaning is it's what you say when the burglars have been the night before and you're heartbroken because they've taken your stereo or whatever it happens to be, your MP4 player, and, <clears throat> and you say they came in and turned the place over. And so Richard was trying to draw attention to the question of the assets of a city and who owns them and who, in whose favor is change. That's the question he's trying to ask with this artwork, turning the place over. Anyway, it's there for you to look at while I'm talking. The title of my talk, Poetry and Patronage, Artists Thinking at Work in the City. I want to, uh, I have two ambitions, really, with the talk. One is to discuss the idea of patronage. What does patronage mean? Uh, and secondly, to give some case studies of how artists negotiate patronage. Uh, in case you're wondering where the poetry comes in, it's just alliteration, I'm afraid. The word patron is, is normally used to mean the person who pays for something. But money is shorthand for a relationship. The relationship is what's important. I want to focus on the relationship rather than the money. Because it's the relationship that is the reason why the money changes hands. The idea that art is a relationship has been thoroughly explored in the last 20 years through the concept of relational art. But of course, art has always been the relationship that hovers over the object, without which the art object becomes just an object. The relational nature of art 
it makes it particularly vulnerable to debasement. For people who define relationships in monetary terms, art can quickly become the equivalent of money, a currency of exchange stripped of its cultural relations. Art is contained by many kinds of relationships, but they're best analyzed through the concept of need. I don't want to talk about instrumentalism and art right now, but I, do, I would be happy to talk about it later if anyone wants to. So people buy art to fill a need. It may be the need to express themselves, the need to have fun, the need to impress their friends, the need to support their friends, the need to fill the gap on the wall over the bed, and all those other things. These are private needs, generally paid for by private money. The social needs of art, of art for art, sorry, the social needs for art, are similarly varied and numerous. The need to create brand value, the need to represent moral values and beauty, the need to sell, sell real estate, the need to create tourism, the need to rewrite history, the need to remember history, the need to imagine a future, the need to improve the urban infrastructure, etc., etc. These social needs for art tend to be funded partly or wholly from the tax base. <coughs> Trusts and private foundations are also supported from the tax base. They usually represent money that has been set aside to avoid tax. And our presence in this room is supported by the tax base. I just wanted to make this point as clearly as possible because when we talk about the art market, very often we think about it as being private money. There is a huge market for art that is from the tax base, including private trusts and foundations. So this talk focuses on some of the forms of social need for art. And as I mentioned earlier, the first part looks at the patronage of recurrent art exhibitions. The second part looks at artists' thinking in relation to social needs. I could have looked at museums of art as a way to study the social need and patronage of art. But recurrent art exhibitions are, I think, more interesting. The recurrent exhibition is a more flexible medium than the museum. Museums are usually as inflexible as their bricks and mortar. The bricks and mortar component of museums is essential because most museums are founded in order to regenerate real estate. This has been true since Napoleon put his loot in the underused buildings of the Louvre and since Tate Britain was built on reclaimed marshes in Pimlico. Tate Modern would not be on Bankside if it were not for the regeneration of Southwark. I sometimes provoke my colleagues in museums by referring to biennials as the museums of the future. When a generation ago museums changed from being preservers of culture to becoming producers of culture, they also forfeited the rationale for holding collections and maintaining buildings. A recurrent exhibition can reinvent itself in every iteration, two years, three years, etc., because its institutional form tends to be highly flexible, often consisting in documentation alone. So, I just want to get up this. <clears throat> okay. Um, then, no, uh, how do I? Slideshow. Thanks. There should be no more technical problems now. That's, that's uh, right. <clears throat> There are a lot of recurrent exhibitions, probably as many recurrent exhibitions as there are museums. This slide shows a selection of recurrent exhibitions whose first iteration was in 2005. It's a page I copied at random from WWW Asia Art Archive. It demonstrates a range of, a range of geography, medium, and ambition. And I've tried to analyze in the list of categories that follow, the social need that each of them might represent. 
I don't want to say anything about these individual um, exhibitions, but as you can see, there's every, they cover the world, globally speaking. They cover every kind of um, medium. And as I hope to explore now, they're representative of lots of different um, kinds of social need. So I've, I've got this, what I call the typology of recurrent exhibitions. I'm looking at their rationale. Because people often talk about biennials and triennials as if they were all the same thing. I think it's really important to distinguish that they have different kinds of aims and objectives. And that allows one to critique them in a more um, cogent way. So the first set, I would say, uh, is the remit to research acquisitions for a museum collection. This is one of the oldest reasons for a recurring exhibition. Uh, it was too difficult to get the board of the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh to visit Europe. So the Carnegie International Exhibition, founded in 1896, brought art every year from Europe to Pittsburgh. This allowed the board to decide what they would like to acquire for the collection. This was in the days when international meant art made in London, Paris, New York, and Milan. The word international has changed a lot in its meaning. The Whitney Biennial of Contemporary Art <coughs> and the Fukuoka Triennial at the Fukuoka Museum perform the same fun function. Whenever a recurrent exhibition is organized by a museum, and in London there's the Tate Triennial, the question hovers in the air as to whether the art will be acquired for a collection. Two, the proposition about what's new in contemporary art for people who are unable to travel to see it. Uh, this need is just like the first one, but for a wider group of people. Historically, it led to the foundation of Sao Paulo Biennale in the 1950s and Sydney Biennale in the 1970s. The art circles in each of these cities felt relatively remote from the geographic areas of art production for international art, as I just defined it. And they were interested to bring that art uh, closer. So the answer was to make an exhibition and bring it to their city. This allowed a larger number of people to become acquainted with new developments in contemporary art. Collectors and museums could provide a context for the art they collected and increase the social appreciation of their initiative. Greater opportunity for travel for educated people and the greater availability of information has devalued this motive for recurrent exhibitions. So you don't find them being founded for this kind of reason anymore. But I've included Guangzhou in this category because although it was founded in the 1980s as a memorial to the democracy movement in Korea, the social belief inherent in it is that access to art and information from diverse cultures underpins democracy. Three, one person's overarching philosophical proposition about contemporary life, culture, and everything else illustrated through a selection of artworks. <laughs> I, I find this process long-winded. <laughs> Just as television has increasingly foregrounded the news presenter and downplayed the news itself, this kind of exhibition came to prominence in the 1980s as a recognition of the social need for celebrity as the means to introduce art to a wide audience. The Venice Biennale did not start this way in 1895. It started as a trade fair in the tradition of the international exhibitions of the 19th century, paid for and powered by the national pavilions. But by the 1980s, the need of Venice to cater to the insatiable needs of a broader kind of tourism led to the establishment of a person personality-led exhibition which is still, however, very largely paid for by the participants, not by the organizer. The hope that a celebrated presenter will bring a large audience is also clear in the exhibitions of Lyon, Busan, Berlin, and Yokohama. Sorry. So fourthly, the remit to rewrite and reclaim art history, academic thesis as contemporary art exhibition. 
the academic industry is the third validator of art after the sale room and the museum industries. Documentary in Castle was founded in 1955 as an adjunct to a horticultural exhibition. It aimed to reclaim Germany's lost modernist art history from the years of the Third Reich and to place this alongside the modernism of New York and Paris. It was founded by the director of the Fredericianum Museum, who had a building but lacked the historic rationale for building a collection of modern art. Although the flavor of Documenta has varied over the years, it is still perhaps the most scholarly in its desire to rewrite art history every five years in accordance with a perceived social need. Five, the remit to reclaim cultural geography, national, post-colonial, and regional. In some places, the social need to reclaim cultural geography has given exhibitions a remit to do this. Manifesta, for instance, was founded after the fall of the Berlin Wall as a result of a desire to reintegrate the production and marketing of art from the former Soviet bloc with that of the rest of Europe. As a European initiative, it was felt that its message could be best expressed by moving the exhibition around in Europe, so it's nomadic. Havana Biennale was founded in 1985 to celebrate the art of the Latin American countries, part of Cuba's desire to be seen as a cultural and political leader in that set of histories. But already by its second iteration, it included art from Africa and Asia, but not the developed world. Uh, Mercosur Biennale in Porto Alegre in Brazil is similarly focused on a need to celebrate the art of Latin America. Six, the art form review. This is one of the oldest and possibly the most numerous type of recurrent exhibition. And in a way, it's my favorite, too. The biennial review of a particular artistic medium. It could be described as the Craft Guild exhibition, since it's basically organized by artists for artists to meet each other and to steal each other's techniques and ideas. It's much like an illustrated academic conference. There are definitely fewer ceramics, print, and small sculpture biennials than there used to be. But painting biennials, such as the John Moore Painting Prize, continue. And there is still growth in live art, video, and of course, electronic media. ICEA is the International Seminar on Electronic Art. It has research written all over it, and it is also nomadic, hosted usually by a combination of art and educational institutions. Performer, founded in 2005 in New York to celebrate live art. Scape a was, is a biennial celebration of art in public space in Christchurch, New Zealand. And the photography bonanza in Arles in the south of France are all tied into the institutional structure of their urban hosts. Getting near the end of this list now, you'll be happy to hear. The art fair by another name, or the dealer's voice ventriloquized through the curator. There are numbers of recurrent exhibitions which are founded in response to a perceived need for a cultural profile, but for which there is no supporting public tax base. This tends to be the case in recent democracies where the government wishes to project the appearance of a lively culture. Often there is some money for promotion, but no money for making the exhibition. Alongside Venice, which I mentioned earlier, examples include Johannesburg, which is currently in remission, Kiev, and Moscow. Finally, the exhibition of context-sensitive commissions, artists invited to engage with time and place. There are a handful of exhibitions <clears throat> for which artists are invited to engage with the specifics of the place and time in non-gallery spaces. That is, there is a perceived social need for art to address narratives other than the history of art. Art within the museum always addresses the narrative of the history of art. The first iteration of Sculpture Project Munster was in 1977, and it takes place every 10 years, with some of the, some of the art finding its way into the town museum and some remaining in the street. 
The curator, Caspar Koenig, has been involved in each exhibition over this 40-year period. Echiko Chumari Triennale in northern Japan is a much more recent initiative, and Prospect New Orleans was founded as a response to Hurricane Tr Katrina. Folkestone Triennial has taken place only twice to date, but it's the UK version of Munster. It was set out with Munster in mind. So, I hope this first part of what I had to say has suggested the wide variety of social need that creates the patronage that pays for art and therefore pays for art exhibitions. The second part of my talk is about how artists, invited by Liverpool Biennial, have used tax-based money to address some social needs. Pioneers, I just want to recognize and remember the work of John and Barbara Latham, uh, who in the uh, 1970s set up a group called Artist Placement Group, uh, whose aim was to infiltrate um, what they would have thought of as the system, mainly, mainly business, uh, to place artists within a business structure in order to change the way in which business worked. It was a really visionary uh, and pioneering uh, a, 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 a attempt to, to introduce artists' thinking into the workplace um, at a time when conceptual art or the idea that artists might do anything other than make craft objects was still very new. And I think the main difference is that they were, in, they were really focused on the uh, private, uh, on, on uh, business and, uh, as it were, private money, private patronage, whereas most of what I have to talk about is about public patronage. That is also because Liverpool is a city where almost everybody is employed by the public sector. There's very little business uh, in Liverpool. Anyhow, the first... So I'm, I'm going to, in each case, I'm going to introduce a patron, if you like, <clears throat> and then, and then uh, talk about the artist's response. This first um, patron is the um, City uh, Council uh, Department of Parks and Highways. Um, <clears throat> the people who, who look after parks and highways in a in city, well, not so much highways, but parks, always want more people to use the parks because they're forever worried about being cut if they can prove that more and more people are using the green spaces, then they, then they are not so worried about being cut. So the, the artistic strategy is to find out how to make use of the park's desire to spend money on promotion and getting more people in. Um, this, the site that, that I'm going to talk about here is, not, is actually a site where there is a huge amount of footfall, but people don't stay for very long. It's the waterfront at Liverpool, uh, on a place which is called the Pier Head, and it's a green, a green patch. It used to be the place where trade union uh, activists would speak to the trade unions, and it used also to be a bus station, but all those activities have been cleared away to leave a large patch of green, which is not used as much as it could be. Um, and the park's people have to mow it. Did you know that cutting grass is the most expensive thing that most, <laughs> most parks departments have to do? Peter Johansson from um, Sweden uh, visited Liverpool at the time of the Matthew Street Festival, which is a, a music festival. And in the festival, he heard a lot of Beatles um, uh, look-alike bands, but not as many as ABBA. ABBA was, in his mind, without doubt, the salient feature of the Matthew Street Festival. And so he couldn't quite understand why Liverpool has a Beatles museum, but it doesn't have a ABBA museum. So he decided to create an ABBA museum for the duration of the biennial. Uh, in the form of a Swedish house painted red. Um, 
the idea of the ABBA house was to get people to think about that cultural difference between the Beatles and ABBA and their, the, the relative um, celebrity of those bands in each museum, uh, that in, sorry, in each city, in, in Liverpool as opposed to Stockholm. Um, but also to get people to spend longer in the green, on the green patch. And the, uh, inside this house, they played um, Music Royale, which is um, what I always thought was called Dancing Queen, um, endlessly. The public were able to enter the house, and it was painted as red inside as it was outside. So, um, Peter Johansson, well, we felt that Peter Johansson's um, artwork was a success because it, um, was, it was clearly very memorable after it had been taken down. Taxi drivers still, say, still said, do you, want to, do you want to go to the, to the Red House? Um, it entered into the kind of folklore of Liverpool people. The Parks people were very happy because they saw how many people would come and um, listen to the music uh, and populate their green spaces. Um, transport, a lot of money is spent on transport. <clears throat> um, the people who run transport um, agencies, airports, trains, buses, um, want their customers to feel looked after or entertained. Um, Liverpool Airport uh, also has a Beatles theme, I'm afraid. It's called John Lennon Airport. And it, um, the man who was running it when we commissioned this artwork uh, some years ago uh, was keen for it to be seen as an artistic airport. I think he'd been to Schiphol and saw the artworks from the, no, from the um, state, state Museum there. <clears throat> anyway, with the Beatles theme, um, he was keen for us to, he was keen to help us commission an artwork at the airport. We asked the Portuguese artist Rigo to, um, to consider what he could do with the airport, and he came up with um, these uh, decals just to put words on the front of the, of the airport. You can see dragism, madism. This is a quotation from a John, Lennon, uh, John Lennon's lyrics. Uh, it's from Give Peace a Chance, in fact. You probably can't read this from the back, so I'll read it for you. Everybody's talking about bagism, shagism, dragism, madism, ragism, tagism, thisism, this, thatism, ismism, ism. All we're saying is give peace a chance. So um, that's what it says inside the airport, and it's still there four years later. But this was, it was put up in 2006 for the 2006 Liverpool Biennial at a time when... Um, uh, the war in Iraq was still extremely hot news. Um, <clears throat> and Liverpool, uh, like many poor cities, um, sends a lot of its young people to war because they can't get jobs at home, so they get jobs going off to war. And a lot of the service people from Liverpool would have gone off to war from Liverpool Airport. So there's a particular poignancy or particular point in, um, in setting John Lennon's ideals and, and uh, if you think of John Lennon as the patron of the airport, patron saint of the airport, John Lennon's ideals set against the um, sight of uh, lots of young people going off to war. It's a kind of activism in a quiet way. But the airport, I'm happy to say, were very pleased with it. They um, were happy to ride that contradiction in their custom. Another form of transport. <clears throat> Community um, organizations very often own minibuses. Um, the minibuses in themselves are an opportunity for our works. The curator Gerardo Mosquera from um, Cuba suggested that we work with Oscar Melgar and Jesus Javier Jaime, who are bus painters from Panama. Uh, and 
so Oscar and Jesus came to talk to the communities, the community organizations who own these buses and find out what interested them and uh, they painted up the buses um, with using imagery that was suggested to them by the uh, communities involved. Rather unimaginatively, the communities <laughs> often seem to suggest that they should paint them up with biennial images. Um, and these, in fact, are self-portraits of, of Oscar and Jesus. But um, as you can see, there's, there's uh, Peter Johansson's Red House commemorated there, and the other images are also based on this has nothing to do with the biennial, this is to do with the docks. And it's, uh, and it's called Panamanian because there used to be uh, cargo ships going from Liverpool to Panama, of course. A different form of transport uh, opportunity. Um, many cities have guided tours for tourists, uh, which take place in buses. Um, Martha Rosler decided to, as it were, hijack one of these uh, tourist buses, and uh, she researched and made a video about what she called Liverpool Underground, which was about, about Liverpool's history, but in particular it was about Liverpool's hidden history, the history which the tourist buses keep you away from. So she wanted to make, as it were, the, the alternative tourist bus that would tell you what no one else dared to tell you. And there was this wonderful um, anomaly that you go on a bus tour, usually in order to look out the window and see what, and the, and the tour guide talks to you about what you can see. Um, Martha's video, uh, what, first of all, you were asked to look at the video, not look out the window, so, so you, you, you weren't looking at what was out of the window, but the video was telling you about what you couldn't see <clears throat> out the window. And a lot of what it was telling you about was what was underground. I mean, people buried underground or, or um, uh, you know, history is often buried. So uh, anyway, that was, a, that was a beautiful piece uh, and gave um, a different dimension to tourism in the city. A different for form of tourism, I mean, tur tourists also need hotels. And so that represents lots of opportunity for, um, uh, for patronage. Uh, Liverpool's, uh, Liverpool has become a tourist city since it was no longer an active passenger port. Um, and, uh, and it's really a kind of, the, the, the main kind of tourism that it gets is heritage tourism, tourists wanting to see heritage of one kind or another. And um, this, uh, what you can see here is the top of the Queen Victoria Monument in Castle, uh, at the end of Castle Street in Liverpool city centre, which is kind of a, a main square. And it looks as if this monument is being conserved some kind of work being done on the monument to uh, clean it or conserve it or whatever, as often happens with heritage. Um, in fact, what had happened with this um, monument is that uh, Tazra Nishino had built a hotel around it, uh, a one-room hotel, so that um, it was possible to hire the room for the night uh, for the duration of the exhibition and spend a night with Queen Victoria, should you wish to do that. Uh, it was very popular, I have to say. It sold out uh, in two days. I mean, all the, all, the, all the nights available sold out within two days. Unfortunately, it was only one room. Um, I particularly enjoyed this um, piece because um, not only because we managed to get some sponsorship out of um, out of Holiday Inn Express which is the first time they had responded to our request for sponsorship 
they, they actually cleaned the room and, and changed the bed linen and all the rest of it, <coughs> which is very good of them. Um, but um, I enjoyed it really because Tazra and Ashina had addressed two absolutely key issues in the city's um, self-imagining or self-image. Uh, one issue is to do with um, heritage and the way in which uh, the, the, there were people in the city who were worried that the city was turning itself into a living museum. You know, they were worried that they were going to be asked to dress up in Elizabethan clothes all the time and wander around the streets for the benefit of tourists taking photographs. Um, you know, people who have had what they call pre proper jobs, um, you know, making cars or something, uh, if they're then asked to look after tourists, they feel demeaned somehow. I mean, they're being retrained, but, but it's very difficult to make that transition from what are considered um, proper jobs to jobs that are uh, to do with tourism and the media industries. Um, but anyway, so, so, so Tazra and Ashina picked up on this underlying anxiety in, among the people of the city about the museumification of the city. Um, and, you know, themed hotels is only one of the aspects of what happens to a city becoming, um, when it becomes, when tourism becomes the main um, issue. The second, the second theme that he addressed through this was the privatization of public space, which is something which is happening in every city, not just Liverpool. Every city is attempting to offload the maintenance costs and security costs of its public space onto private developers. And so uh, every city is selling your property and my property, if we are taxpayers, to private developers. Once that space passes into the hands of private developers, it has changed its meaning. Uh, and the range of activities which you can carry on in that space has also changed. Uh, for instance, you can no longer call political meetings. You can no longer uh, address your trade union comrades as an activist. Um, uh, those kind of activities that any citizen might wish to uh, undertake as a citizen have been replaced solely by activities and behavior as a consumer or client. So through this is, this is the privatization of public space is one way in which states, and it's happening all over the world, not only in this country, are transforming all of us from being citizens to being consumers, primarily speaking. Media space. Um, the, the, the space within media is huge, of course. In many ways, it's bigger than the space of geography. Um, the space in people's heads uh, is the space which everybody wants. Uh, a place within <clears throat> and recognition from. Uh, and uh, Sanya Ivekovic uh, is, a, is an artist from um, Croatia. Uh, she currently has a, a one person show on at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And in uh, 2006, we invited her to. Uh, do something in Liverpool, <clears throat> and she chose to work with, pub with media space. And the Liverpool Echo is the uh, local, um, uh, the local evening paper, um, with a large circulation. Uh, and the needs, the need which she, the the the, the manifest need which she, the, the obvious need which she wanted to address was seating in the city. She wanted to design. Um, uh, benches which would be attractive and which could be put up around the streets in the city centre. Um, the, the hidden need that she wanted to um, address is the need for discussion. 
So what she did was she, um, she, devised, uh, she devised some questions w w by talking with readership, readers of the Liverpool Echo. She devised some questions which would, which would uh, create debate. And then for, in, for each of the 10 weeks of the exhibition, she, uh, she got the paper to print this uh, question to be debated, and also to c the paper collected the res people's responses to it. So they built up a um, statistical response to these questions. They were always yes, no questions. And um, so what happened was that she was able to express the result of the polls um, in the form of a pie chart with, with just one slice in it, like that. <clears throat> um, so at the end of the exhibition, we had 10 of these benches um, uh, around the city center, which had asked uh, different questions, like uh, these, this one is, um, uh, is love all we need? 75% say no. 25% say yes. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a one which is too small there for you to read, which is, do you want gender equality? 66% say no. 34% say yes. So these, these are questions which... Um, so, okay, so she created some public seating. She, she got people to address some questions, and we hope that that last one certainly provoked a good deal of debate at home for most people. But, but actually what she was doing was poking fun at the inadequacies of the democratic of the, of, the, of the idea of the referendum. You know, what's happening in Scotland at the moment with, with whether Scots people are allowed to say yes or no to wanting to be part of the UK or not. Um, is that question going to be complicated by the introduction of halfway house questions? And what does that do to the, to the, to the issue? And the, 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 the problematization of democracy as it has as it has grown and as it is currently um, practiced in this and other Western democracies is, is actually what she's trying to um, raise awareness about. I can't see the clock. Can anyone tell me what the time is? 10.2. I need to hurry. Um, <clears throat> Um, Lisa said you might enjoy this one. This is, this is, this is um, derelict sites in a city. I mean, everybody hates derelict sites. Very often the, the, the city council or the, the borough has no money to do anything with them. Uh, there's very often a private landlord who doesn't want to do anything with them or can't afford to do anything with them, so they just sit there. And they sit there looking miserable and they make everybody miserable all around. In recent years, as, as most of you are aware, there's been a movement called guerrilla gardening, where people, sim without permission, simply walk into these unoccupied spaces and start gardening in there, <clears throat> growing things, uh, because they're nicer to look at. And also, if you're lucky, you can eat the food at the other end. Um, I've called it behind the billboard, because um, I, I was unaware before I started inquiring into this kind of thing that, that, uh, that people buy empty lots, not in order to build houses on the empty lot, but in order to put a billboard on the front of the lot, because you can actually make a lot of money from a billboard. Behind the billboard, there's nothing. <laughs> so there's all this empty space. In, I'm not talking about in London, but in many cities around the country. <clears throat> um, all this space with a billboard on the front and nothing behind. And landlords actually don't care what happens behind that billboard. So they'd be very happy for you to grow food. And that's why the guerrilla gardening movement has taken off. Azrak Shamitsa is a, an artist from um, uh, uh, Slovenia who um, worked with 
local people in St. George's Square in Liverpool, handed out lots of uh, window boxes, got them to grow things, and, <coughs> and we had a, a meal on the proceeds at the end of the exhibition. Um, and uh, we hope that the habit stuck. What I really want to talk about is contested space. Um, contested space is the most interesting space because there are different needs. That's to say, there are different interest groups whose needs are at variance with each other. <clears throat> so I already talked about Arrigo and his work, uh, his pacifist activism. Um, seeing these um, uh, imperial lions in Liverpool was a red rag to a bull as far as Rigo was concerned. He recognized their historic provenance as uh, militaristic symbols of imperialism. And so his reaction to that was to put them in cages, which, of course, did say something about what has happened to the British Empire. Um, and I'm sure it annoyed some people who still think there is a British Empire. Um, but what was, what was interesting for us was that um, the pub across the road, <coughs> the, the building behind is called St. George's Hall, and it's kind of the big civ civic building in Liverpool. Um, the, the pub across the road started printing T-shirts saying, Free the St. George's Four. <coughs> so this, this artwork had obviously gone straight into the bloodstream in some sense of, of, of Liverpool people, and it produced that kind of entrepreneurial reaction, um, making money out of it. But also there was this, this very, we found that somebody on a regular basis was leaving cat food um, <laughs> for, <coughs> for one of the lions, um, which, um, which I think, you know, I, I don't know in what spirit it was made, but it's the idea that um, the empire is now living on charity. The high street is always contested space. Everybody thinks they own it. Everybody wants different things from it. Um, uh, of course, some, if they're developers, they have begun to own it completely. So, um, so there won't be any contested space in future because it's all owned by developers. But for the meanwhile, it's possible to express diverse opinions on the high street. And um, Yoko Ono, in particular, wanted to express uh, an opinion in favor of nakedness. Uh, this project was called uh, My Mummy Was Beautiful. Uh, and she wanted to collect people's memories about their mothers. I mean, uh, a naked breast is the first thing anybody sees when they come into this world. So uh, it's not exactly um, uh, offensive. But many people did find it extremely offensive. And it stirred up every kind of possible um, prejudice, which is wonderful. It created some wonderful debates uh, in Liverpool in the run-up to Liverpool's uh, year as um, European capital of culture. And I'm not saying that was the point as far as Yoko was concerned, but it was certainly the point as far as the biennial was concerned, was to test out Liverpool's pe Liverpool people's willingness and ability to face the diversity of culture and the diversity of opinions and beliefs that um, are current on the high street, the beach. Uh, the beach, I had no idea that the beach was such a contested space. But of course, I mean, we were invited to make a sculpture, or so we were invited to place an artwork on the beach or, uh, at Crosby. This is a map. Um, uh, in order to increase the footfall to the beach. That's in, in everyday words, that means to make more people go to the beach. Um, the idea of making more people going to the beach was to improve the opportunities for businesses in the hinterland just behind the beach. Um, uh, I responded to this invitation by inviting Anthony Gormley to put his um, another place on the beach, and the stars represent where his hundred iron figures are placed. Um, but the process of trying to get the sculpture on the beach was a very rocky, long road, because, of course, although the official line was that more people should come to the beach to improve local business, all the people who lived behind the beach 
wanted the beach to themselves, and the last thing they wanted was anyone else to come there. So we found a great deal of opposition from the start to putting a good sculpture which people would come and look at. Um, and it, uh, the, anti, the, ex the expression of opinion against what it was that we were trying to do was as various as there are different kinds of people. So there were people who like worms, who complained that the worms would be, um, the worms would be upset. People who like birds, afraid that the birds would be upset. The people who like dogs were afraid they wouldn't be able to walk their dogs anymore. People who, shri who, who, who fish for shrimps um, said they, they wouldn't be able to carry on their trade fishing for shrimps anymore. Actually, shrimping you have to have a license for, and nobody has a, a license for shrimping on Crosby Beach, so we were a bit intrigued by that one. Anyway, finally, the, the battle was won, and uh, the space, uh, and I'm afraid the people who wanted the beach to themselves no longer have it to themselves, because there are 100 people there, day and night. Um, okay, I've come to the end of that. Thank you very much. Um, Actually, I forgot to kind of say just, just three things at the end. The role of art in getting people to talk is really, is really important. Um, it, it brings hidden agendas into the, into the open. It creates a learning experience. And potentially, as, as we have found through the work of Liverpool Biennial, it can be a catalyst for conflict resolution. I mean, different, different, different communities at odds with each other if you put an artwork between them, they forget about their conflict and they start both rejecting the artwork and find, and find that they're friends after all. You know, it's, it, can do, it, can, it can do a wonderful job in bringing communities together. Thank you very much. Yeah, any questions? <clears throat> because I think I was told to leave 10 minutes for questions, so I'd be very happy to take any if there are any. Perhaps we could have some lights back. You all want to get off to Gary Stevens' performance, don't you? Uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, Folkestone is just a very small Liverpool. I mean, it's, it's a former port, which is now... Um, no longer a port, and uh, Liverpool has some of the poorest wards in the north of England, and Folkestone has some of the poorest wards in the south of England. So it's, in many ways, it's a similar city, but it's a tenth the size. Um, I hope to, I hope, I hope I've learned sufficient from what I did in Liverpool to do something better in Folkestone. I know, that, I know that some of you have put work in hospitals and so on. We, uh, how, how, much were you, uh, how much did you have in mind the fact that you were, as it were, connecting with a patron? That, that your artwork was going to live by virtue of the discussions that other people had about it as they saw it in the hospital.